Hello and welcome to this time of teaching. Uh, today we're considering the virgin birth. We call it the virgin birth because there is only one virgin birth. Our scripture readings are from the Christmas story, first from Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and she gave him the name Jesus. And then one verse from Luke chapter 1, verse 35, uh, which is the angel speaking to Mary. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So this morning we're considering the line in the Apostles' Creed uh, that says of Jesus, He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And I want to look at this from two angles. The first, uh, why the virgin birth shouldn't be a stumbling block. And second, the purpose of the virgin birth itself. But I'm going to spend most of my efforts on uh, why uh, I don't think the virgin birth should be a stumbling block for anyone. Now, if you don't believe in God, or if you don't believe in miracles, those are stumbling blocks that I'm not addressing this morning. Uh, but if you're watching this, I'm guessing that you must have some openness to God, some openness to miracles, and some openness to Christianity. Uh, but I, I think that the, the, the virgin birth itself shouldn't be a hurdle for some people, even though, strangely, it is one of those hurdles. And if you're in that place, you're a Christian, and, and you're in that place of the virgin birth, I don't know if that makes sense, or maybe it sounds a little bit naive. I think that I can help with that this morning. And that's, that's where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time, on this, this idea that the virgin birth uh, shouldn't be a stumbling block. Now, probably the very first reason, or the most obvious reason, that the virgin birth shouldn't be a stumbling block is because our God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God has that wisdom, that ability, and that power. He can create a fully functioning universe. So when we think about that, and we think about a virgin birth, the virgin birth is small potatoes. Now we believe that, the God, that God spoke the universe into being uh, from nothing. There was nothing, and then there was something, and he began to give it shape and order and to fill it. And in a sense, the virgin birth is actually simpler than that. This, the virgin birth isn't creation from nothing. The virgin birth is the Holy Spirit taking uh, a single cell uh, from Mary and joining that cell to the only Son of God who eternally existed as well. So it's not even creation from nothing. It's the joining of two things and the creation uh, out of uh, matter that already exists uh, from the body of Mary. So in that sense, it's also simpler. Uh, but while it's simpler, I should also say that there's something also uh, more wonderful and, and more amazing or even complex about it, because how do you join God to his creation? That, that's, that's sort of a little bit beyond us. Uh, creation from nothing, that, that, that goes and blows the mind, but then taking God and joining God uh, to humanity uh, so that 
this baby Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's also mind-blowing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So the virgin birth really shouldn't be a stumbling block in terms of his wisdom and his ability and his power. The second reason I don't think any of us should have uh, any trouble with the virgin birth is that the God of the Bible is the God of life. He is the giver of life and the blesser of life. Uh, in Genesis, when God creates the world and forms it and fills it, and he creates humanity, he, he blesses humanity, and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And if you're familiar with the end of the story of Noah and the ark and the flood, when Noah and his sons uh, exit uh, the ark, God says the very same thing, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, babies in the Bible are like God's thing. So that's the second reason I don't think the, the virgin birth should be a stumbling block for anyone. And then the third reason is that, that there are other supernatural births within the Bible. The Bible has five stories of women who were barren, who couldn't have children, and God intervenes so that they can have children. Uh, there, there's Sarah, Rachel, Hannah, the wife of Manoah, those four Old Testament women, and then there's uh, Elizabeth in the New Testament. So there's five women. And it's worth noting that uh, Sarah and Elizabeth, both of them, the Bible notes that they had, or, or they, were, uh, they became pregnant and had children in their old age, which sort of makes it more miraculous uh, if we're wondering about it. It doesn't say the age of Elizabeth, but for Sarah, it says Sarah was 90 and Abraham, her husband, was 100 when Isaac was finally born. So within the Bible, there are already sort of supernatural pregnancies. Uh, they're not virgin births, but they're supernatural. They shouldn't have happened, except that God intervened. Now, as I was quickly reviewing uh, some of the Bible passages about uh, some of these women, uh, two, two, uh, two of these women stood out to me, or I noticed something that was pretty cool, and that's the word Wonderful. Uh, not wonderful in the fluffy sense, but wonderful in the overwhelming sense, in the serious sense, in the wondrous sense that that uh, that shouldn't be able to that shouldn't happen. Um, uh, Jaw dropping, awe inspired, uh, amazement. Uh, no words to express. Kind of wonder. Uh, in Genesis 18, we have uh, God and the two angels appearing to Abraham and Sarah to announce the birth of Isaac. But when Sarah hears of it, uh, she laughs, and God rebukes her, and he says this in Genesis 18, verse 14. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord, or is anything too hard for Yahweh? Uh, the more literal rendering or translation is this. Is anything wonderful for the Lord? Sarah laughs because it's ridiculous at her age. Naturally, normally impossible. She's, she didn't have kids. She's beyond the point of having kids. Uh, her body is worn out. But the God of the Bible who created the heavens and the earth, he can do wonders. And for him, they're not even wonders. Is anything wonderful for the Lord? It's a good rebuke when we doubt what God can do. And then I also found the same, the, the same word wonderful in the story of Manoah's wife in Judges chapter 13. In this episode, Manoah asked the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, for his name. And the angel said this, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. And, and the footnote, which is a little more literal, it reads, Why do you ask my name? It is wonderful. Manoah didn't understand that he was talking with the angel of Yahweh. He and his wife thought that there was a person of God before them, but they didn't understand that it was the angel of Yahweh. And so what the angel says actually goes over his head. Um, but what the angel was saying to Manoah was, I am Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And, uh, and that's one of the interesting parts about the angel of Yahweh. He, on the one hand, often speaks for God, for Yahweh, 
but sometimes he speaks as Yahweh. And the point is that he's saying, this, is, this, is, this isn't wonder, wondrous for me. Uh, God can do this. It's within his power to give fertility. It's not a wonder for him. It's easy peasy. We also find this word wonderful three times in Psalm 139. And the second and third time uh, is actually speaking about the processes in the womb of a child being formed. Verses 13 and 14, they say this, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. According to Psalm 139, what we might consider uh, a normal, ordinary, or, or natural birth or conception is actually in the category of wonderful. Wonderful in the serious, awesome sense. And you've heard it said when a baby is born, he or she is a miracle. And that's the truth. That's what Psalm 139 is saying, that, that what has been brought together to create a baby is, in fact, wonderful. It is a miracle. And then one last verse concerning wonderful, and it has directly to do with Jesus himself. It's one of our favorite Christmas passages, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Jesus Christ was a wonderful baby in the most serious sense. He was Mighty God. He was Everlasting Father. He was Prince of Peace. And he was also Wonderful Counselor. And that is in the sense that his wisdom was beyond ordinary wisdom or human insight. He would have insight and wisdom that was equal to God because he was God. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says this, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's Jesus Christ, the wonderful counselor. How many times did, did the religious leaders come to Jesus in order to, to trap him in his words, and he only made them look foolish? They didn't know that they were debating with the wonderful counselor. And then, and then I want to point to one last thing to me that makes the virgin birth reasonable or something that we shouldn't be stumbling over uh, before touching on the purpose of the virgin birth. In the virgin birth, there's, there's a parallel to the creation of Eve that we find back in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, we have a, a really quick and general uh, description of the creation of man and woman. It, it's very fast. But then in Genesis chapter 2, we get the slowed down, detailed version of how Adam and Eve were created. It says that for Adam, God formed him from the dust of the earth and he breathed into him. Uh, but for Eve, it says that something very different happened. Uh, for Eve, it says that God caused Adam to sleep and he took a rib from Adam's side, and out of that rib, he formed the woman. He formed Eve. And the virgin birth is so similar to that, um, where uh, with Adam, a piece of his flesh was taken to create the woman. The virgin birth is the same, except it's uh, God took of the woman, and he made a man. He formed a man from the woman. If you accept Genesis, uh, the virgin birth really isn't hard to accept either. You see how it's the same creator. You see how uh, in, in God looking to redeem humanity, how he actually echoes what he did at the creation. His character comes through again as being the same. And this brings me to another po important point that I think is worth saying. When it comes to miracles, if someone says something is a miracle, there's a part of me that's actually a skeptic. Uh, when someone announces a miracle to me, I'm sort of like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to jump on board very quickly. I have, I have two questions when I hear about miracles. Uh, one question is, does this fit with the pattern and character of God that I know in the Bible? Uh, that's important. And then my other question is, well, what is the purpose of this miracle? 
Uh, and this brings me to, to my second uh, angle with which I want to look at the, at the virgin birth with. Uh, and that is, what is the purpose of the virgin birth? It has to have a purpose. So very quickly, the purpose of the virgin birth, or, or uh, we'll, we'll start with conception. The, the purpose of the conception by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, what is the purpose of that con- conception? The purpose of it is to bring our humanity, uh, or Adam's humanity, which Mary had, because she is the daughter of Adam, uh, and join that to the eternal Son of the Father, except without sin. The, the pollution of Adam's sin uh, filtered out. That's the purpose of, uh, of the Holy Spirit conception within Mary, to join our humanity, but without the pollution of sin, to the eternal Son of the Father. And the reason for this is because Jesus needed to be fully human and he needed to be sinless in order to be a sacrifice and pay for our sins. And if you want to talk about the purpose of the virgin birth, uh, that is the purpose. And that Jesus was physically born to Mary, the creed includes that, uh, that he was born of the virgin Mary. The purpose of that is to affirm that Jesus came in the flesh that he really did become one of us, he really did become human, it's without dispute. And this teaching of the virgin birth uh, and of the son, uh, the virgin birth of the son, uh, it should give us great comfort and strength because it shows how wonderfully, in the serious sense of, word, of the word, how wonderfully God loves us. He's that serious in his love for us. Uh, Jesus isn't just God showing up to look around and and to to, to, uh, put out some nice teachings for us. Jesus is God showing up, taking on our humanity in order that he might suffer and deliver us from our sin and our misery. And, And he's not indifferent to what we suffer. He has become one of us. In fact, he is God wonderfully with us. He is God wonderfully one of us. God wonderfully saving us. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Catholic means universal, and so meaning the followers of Jesus Christ of all times and places.